in three, two, one. Okay, so this is um, a different resource for fetal development, but I think it's a little more comprehensive. So we'll add this into our little um, itinerary. So let me go through just the basics here. Uh, I'm not even going to go over the objectives, okay? Um, and I'm going to briefly go over this. So in your cells, right, you have the DNA and the nucleus. The nucleus controls the cell. Okay, this is kind of a review of anatomy and physiology, okay? So whatever genes and chromosomes are in a person's DNA, that's what make you, you, right? Determine your individual traits. So every, every, every person can say, contains 46 chromosomes. 22 pairs are the autosomes, and the one, the last pair, the 23rd pair, is the sex chromosomes. And biological development is influenced by a lot of things. In a negative way, right? External environment, teratogens, those are things that are damaging to a baby. Of course, you know, drugs, those types of things. Uh, drug use. And when I say drugs, these are now illegal drugs. And then, of course, undernutrition, not good. And smoking, not good. Okay. So what happens is, is the process of mitosis, right? What happens is when the sperm meets the egg, boom. Now you've got conception, fertilization has occurred, and the cells start to divide and divide and divide and divide and divide and divide and divide. Okay, and I'm not going to get into the specific, specific details. We don't need to go through all of that. So I'm going to kind of breeze through some of this. Okay, that's a nice flow chart of what happens with the sperm when it divides and with the egg when it divides. Okay. Fertilization occurs when the sperm penetrates the ovum. It literally has to break through the wall of the egg, right? And then what happens is it travels through the fallopian tube and it goes into the uterus and implants itself, okay? The second that a sperm hits an egg, there's this crazy thing that happens with the membrane that no other sperm can get in. It's like the walls are closed, boom, crazy. It's amazing. And here's a really, really good picture of the process, the specificity of the process that occurs once fertilization occurs. Here, let me try this a little bit smaller so this is bigger. So do you see how specific this is? So there's your ovary. There's the little egg at the released oocyte, right? And when it gets fertilized by the sperm, boom, right there. Now all of a sudden it's a zygote. Now it's two cells and then four and then eight and then 16, and then kaboom, it's a blastocyst, and then it implants itself, okay? Yeah, and sperm can live up to five days. That's, that's really pushing it. You, the, the average typical life of a sperm is about 48 to 72 hours. Sperm either have X or Y, so the man determines the gender of the fetus um, and the pH of the vagina and the, and the whole reproductive tract has a big influence on the whether the X or the Y gets to the egg first, right? So there are some, you ever notice some families, they keep having boy, 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 boy. They keep trying for a girl, no girl, or the opposite girl, girl, girl. It A lot of that has to do with the pH of the woman's reproductive tract because it can be more friendly to one specific gender of sperm versus the other. So two X's, you have a girl, X, Y, you have a boy. Okay, we know that it's determined by the father's sperm. And each gene that's, that's given by the sperm and by the egg carries the instruction for dominant and recessive traits as well as diseases, right? So the dominant ones are the ones that are the strong ones and they usually overpower the recessive ones, okay? And that's passed on to the baby, to the offspring. Told you it's a zygote. Initially, when the sperm and the ovum meet, um, it goes through that mitosis. Um, and it doesn't get any bigger. That This is an interesting fact that I forgot to tell you. This The zygote doesn't get bigger as it starts to divide and become more and more cells. The cells get smaller, right? And that's a marula. Okay. Maternal fetal circulation. This one is important. And this makes it pretty easy. Okay, so let's go over this. This is the uterus, 
This is the uterus on drugs. No, I'm kidding. Um, this is the mucus plug that closes up the cervical oz, and this is the cervix, and this is the vagina, okay? In the uterus up here, we have the placenta. There's the umbilical cord, and it's attached to the little itty-bitty fetus, okay? And then around the fetus is the amniotic sac, right? See that? So when you look at the placenta, do you see all these little squiggly, squiggly things here? These are arteries and veins that go from the umbilicus into the placenta and cross through the uterus to mom. So this helps you understand if there's, for example, an abruptio placenta. Imagine when this rips away, it's ripping arteries and veins out of the wall of the uterus. So that's why it hurts, okay? Helps make a little more sense, all right? Okay, moving forward, usually takes about the third day for the little, little zygote to get into the uterus, it floats around the uterus for a couple of days, and it's got two layers of cells because one layer is the baby and the other layer is basically the placenta, okay? And so it's supposed to implant in the upper section of the posterior uterine wall, so the back upper one-third, and it basically buries itself into the lining of the uterus, and then it becomes part of mom starts to grow. Tell me this is not like crazy, amazing stuff. And then as it develops, the cells start to differentiate. So initially the cells are all kind of the same, but now they differentiate into different types of cells. So some cells make the chorion and the amnion, part of the amniotic sac. Some make the yolk sac, and then some make the germ layers, okay? Uh, I'm not going to get into the specifics of the amnion and, and its structures. I don't think that you need to know that. I've never seen a test question on any of that. Um, but amniotic fluid, so amniotic fluid exceeding 1,000 milliliters at term, at the end of the pregnancy, is known as polyhydramnios. Remember, poly means many. Oligohydramnios is not enough amniotic fluid, Okay. And what is the amniotic fluid's job? A lot of things. It maintains the baby's temperature. It prevents the amniotic sac from sticking to the baby. So the baby's floating, right? Um, it allows for the baby to grow symmetrically. And it's buoyant. Think about when you're in water. So the kid can kind of, you know, especially in the first few months of pregnancy, it can like move around and kick and whatever. And it's a cushion to protect the baby and the umbilical cord from any type of injury. Okay. The yolk sac is what develops after the ninth day or so, and it only functions while the baby is an embryo, and it, it starts the production of red blood cells, and it will keep doing that until the little fetus's liver can start to do it on its own, which is somewhere around six weeks. And the umbilical cord will then encompass the yolk sac, and it'll degenerate, like disintegrate. Don't worry about the derm layers. We're not going to get into that. Say ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, stages of prenatal development. So initially it's a zygote. That's when fertilization has first taken place. Then it's an embryo from about the second to the eighth week of development. It is a fetus until it's born. And the age of viability is 20 weeks of gestation. But again, Questionable because that's that's very iffy. That's a tiny, tiny little fetus at 20 weeks. Um, when we talk about the prenatal development, this is the three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and eight weeks. So what's starting to happen here, it doesn't look like a human yet, right? What's happening is it's a little embryo and it's got a groove right here, right? And that's the neural groove. So basically, where is the um, the spinal column? right? Going to gonna start to develop and the spinal cord. So it's very primitive. It's very, you know, it's teeny tiny basic. So even up to eight weeks, this is what you're looking at. Okay. 17 weeks, good pictures, 25 weeks. Now it's starting to look like a baby here. It looks more like an alien. Here it looks like Winston Churchill. And then when we look at prenatal development, here's 29 weeks and 36 weeks. And it's really not an embryo anymore. It's a fetus 
at this point. So you can see the intrauterine, this is, here's the fetus, right? Look, it's, it's basically, it's a baby, right? Looks like a baby, but still not completely cooked. Needs to cook a little bit more. All right, so lesson two, we're going to talk about the accessory structures of pregnancy again briefly. The placenta, the umbilical cord, and fetal circulation, just so you understand fetal circulation, because that one's a little complicated. So the placenta, that is responsible for everything that keeps the little baby alive, right? It's responsible for respiration. In other words, bringing oxygen in and getting rid of carbon dioxide. It's responsible for nutrition, bringing nutrition in, and excretion, getting rid of waste. And the placenta produces four hormones, okay? Progesterone, estrogen, HCG, and HPL, okay? When you take a pregnancy test, it's the human chorionic gonadotropin that we're looking for because those levels double, quadruple, quintuple, like quickly to keep, to, to keep the pregnancy viable, okay? So those are the four hormones that the placenta actually makes. All right. Transfer through the placenta. So again, deoxygenated blood and waste leave the fetus through the two umbilical arteries, okay? The, the blood does not mix yet. This is at, during the birth process where the fetal and maternal blood start to mix. But right now, oxygenated good blood comes from the mother into the inner villa space and the blood vessels brings it to the baby and fetal blood releases carbon dioxide and waste products and it goes out. So there's a constant exchange that's going on at the level of the placenta between the baby and the mom, right? Um, almost everything that you put in your mouth can be transferred to that baby, right? Drugs, nicotine, infectious agents. And if you take drugs when you're pregnant, the baby will be born with a problem with addiction or withdrawal, so which is not fair. And then the hormones, progesterone, what does that do? The functions during pregnancy of progesterone are to maintain that uterine lining, make it nice and thick and rich, and prevent the uterus from contracting so that you don't miscarry. Starts to get the glands in the breasts ready to make milk. And it stimulates the testes in the male fetus to start to produce testosterone, which makes the male fetus become a male fetus. So even though it's got the sex hormones at the time of conception, it doesn't have testes. It's got like the equivalent almost of ovaries. So really, everybody starts out being a woman kind of sort of, which is crazy. Estrogen, what does that do when, you know, when you're pregnant? What's the function of estrogen? That also stimulates the uterine growth, increases blood flow, helps the breasts prepare for, um, you know, for breastfeeding. Um, it also does some other things that are not have nothing to do with the pregnancy, but they're more like side effects, right? So that pigmentation, that cloasma, it's responsible for that. Uh, it's also responsible for some vascular changes in the skin and mucous membranes of the nose and mouth. So in other words, when you're pregnant, you produce more saliva, you produce more sputum. It's not unusual for a pregnant woman to have a stuffy nose or a runny nose, and just a lot, of, a lot of soppy, wet stuff going on around the mouth. That's just because of all the estrogen, okay? The HCG, the human chorionic gonadotropin, okay? That is the thing that, that influences the corpus luteum and continue pro to continue producing estrogen and progesterone. So the corpus, the corpus luteum is what makes the placenta. And so that HCG sustains the pregnancy. It says, keep on making estrogen and keep on making progesterone so this pregnancy stays intact. Um, it used to be that HCG was detectable about seven, like seven to 14 days after fertilization. Now, these pregnancy tests are so sensitive, you can take one before your period is due and they can detect the HCG, which is crazy. All right. So the hormone responsible for a positive pregnancy test is HCG. That is the one. I like that. Okay. All right. Don't worry about the lactogen. That's that fourth hormone. And that's the one that helps mom's blood sugar actually 
<clears throat> it helps mom's blood hang on to more sugar. That's why gestational diabetes is a thing. Because the baby, you're eating for two. So instead of getting rid of all the sugar, it needs to hang on to some and, and give it to the baby so that it can grow. Because that, that embryo, that fetus is growing at such a rapid rate. It's insane. Think about the changes that happen in a nine-month span. So it needs that glucose available in order to meet those growth needs. Okay, so that's what that HPL does. Fun fact, but I've never seen a question, and I won't ask you a question about it, but it's nice to know. The umbilical cord is the lifeline between the mother and the fetus. We know this. Um, two arteries, one vein. Backwards from the body, right? In our bodies, arteries carry blood, oxygenated blood, right? Away from the heart. Veins carry deoxygenated blood. The arteries carry blood away from the fetus, but they're carrying away waste and deoxygenated blood. And the vein is bringing back good blood. There's something called Wharton's jelly that's like a, looks like white jelly or clear, clear to white jelly, covers the cord and the cord's vessels to protect it. It's about 22 inches long, and the umbilical cord usually protrudes around the center of the placenta, okay? Um, Ava, we talked about Ava, artery, vein, artery. That's the way to remember it. Here's maternal fetal circulation again. Here's your fetus umbilical cord and placenta. When we look at a closer view of that placenta, right? This is where all the exchange is taking place because the baby's lungs are filled with fluid, right? What is this right here? Rid of that, okay? In the fetal circulation, there are shunts. There are things that are naturally occurring in the fetus that actually stop working immediately at the time of birth. And they are the foramen ovale, the ductus arteriosus, and the ductus venosus, okay? And I'm hoping there's a picture of this. Let me see. And these things close pretty quickly. The foramen ovale, that's the hole basically in the heart, closes about two hours after birth, but it's usually by three months completely closed. Ductus arteriosus, 15 hours after birth, but fully closed in about three weeks. Ductus venosus closes in about a week. Okay. And after they close, the ductus arteriosus and venosus actually become ligaments. They're no longer vessels, which is also pretty amazing. All right, so I need to get a picture of this circulation. And I will do that. So we already know about impaired prenatal development because of undernutrition. Mom needs to eat and she needs to drink water. Um, it can really be a problem for the baby long term. Um, some other problems that can occur prenatally, intrauterine growth restriction. So sometimes some, some people just have a difficult time either getting pregnant or maintaining a pregnancy. So intrauterine growth restriction is there's not enough room right? The, the uterus, inside the uterus, the area is not big enough, and it, it stunts the growth of the fetus, right? And that's a problem. And fetal growth is assessed with the weight, the length of the gestation, the placental size, and the head, the circumference of the head and abdomen are all taken into account. Undernutrition can result in permanent changes to fetal structure, especially in the first three months. The first trimester, trimester is when the neurological system, the spinal cord, all those things are starting to, to develop. And if there's something that stunts that development or changes the normal pathway of development, you're going to wind up with significant physiological problems with the baby. And then you have multifetal pregnancies. Um, about one in every pregnancy is a twin. But there are different kinds of twins. So we'll talk about that real quick. Um, and when people use hormones, like if they're having trouble getting pregnant and they're taking hormones, they're the ones that often will see twins or triplets or quadruplets. Ugh. So anyway, that, that's the hormones will make the ovaries start to release a lot of eggs, right? You have monozygotic twins, which are identical twins. And that happens when one fertilized egg just splits and becomes two, it's crazy. Dizygotic, and di means two, dizygotic twins come from 
Just so happens that two eggs get released and two sperm, one sperm gets each of those eggs. So you've got basically two separate pregnancies that are just happening simultaneously. And that's a fraternal twin. Okay. Monozygotic twins will always be the same sex, right? Because it's one pregnancy that's split into two. Dizygotic twins could be a boy and a girl. It could, whatever. It's just like two separate pregnancies. And that is the end of this PowerPoint. So I am going to stop the recording, stop the share, and let me stop the recording.